DreamWorks animation. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, how and why we're using Swift in our animation feature film production pipeline. Uh, to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the company and what we do and how we do it, a little bit about the feature animation process itself, and then talk about the ways we're using Swift, both in production and the way we intend to use it in the future. Uh, since we're a media and entertainment company, I can introduce a little bit about us by playing a movie. Uh, we celebrated our 20th anniversary last year, and when we were founded in 1994, DreamWorks Animation and DreamWorks Studios was the first new Hollywood studio in over 75 years. It's a pretty hard business to get into, pretty big investment. Uh, but between economic downturns, uh, audience consumption preference changes and things like that, over the years what's left of our company is the feature animation and television division that I work with and Steven Spielberg's live action television and movie production company. Uh, how do I advance on this thing? Spacebar. There it goes. Oops. Okay, so the movie didn't play. Or maybe just playing slowly. It says it's playing. So imagine a movie <laughs> <laughs> that's showing you pictures of all the properties we've worked on. We've produced over 35 animated films over the last 20 years. We started out as a traditionally hand-drawn animation shop and since then have converted fully to CGI. Interestingly, hand-drawn animation has come back as an art form more than a media, so it's being used to enhance uh, CGI films or to tell the story with a different visual medium. A uh, little text formatting issue, so bear with me. Um, DreamWorks Animation is a, a, a recognized family brand feature-length animation television consumer products company. Um, our product is our characters. Our intellectual property becomes the characters and the situations those characters get involved in. And the manifestation of our product is data. Everybody here has data. It usually describes some other product. Our actual deliverable product happens to be data. So we have a slightly different relationship to information than some companies do. <coughs> Excuse me. This slide represents um, sort of our two main studio investments. We've got DreamWorks Feature Animation, which has a studio in Glendale, California, and another studio in, in Bangalore, India. Excuse me. <coughs> and we're a joint ventures partner with a studio in Shanghai, China called Oriental DreamWorks. That studio's intent is to produce content in China for Chinese consumption and then export it to the rest of the world. Oh, here we go. Uh, some of our characters you might recognize, uh, Shrek, Puss in Boots, characters from The Crudes, things like that. If you have kids, you've seen these movies four or 500 times, probably from the back seat of your car. I apologize for that. You know all the songs. One of the things that's interesting about our environment is it's a, it's a constant arms race between technology, the ability to deliver a capability, and creative ambition. So the creatives on the films always want to put more pixels on the screen, they want to put more vibrant colors, they want to do more motion, they want to do more simulation, they want to change the, the way you see the film to make the visual media and the 3D use of the visual media help tell the story. Um, in, the <coughs> excuse me, in the past, um, things like furry characters and clothing were difficult to do, and they were especially difficult to do together. Uh, in Puss in Boots, as an example, we had a quota on the creatives. They could only have two instances where wet furry characters touched each other, because the amount of computation required to do uh, fur simulation with water, with uh, 3D collisions in space, was more than we had on the compute farm. So that's an example of where a creative decision gets squashed by the technology decisions. One of the things we're trying to do as technologists is not be a barrier. We can give them some guardrails, and we can give them some guidance, but don't let creative ambition be stifled by the technology's ability to deliver it. So I think what's happening is it's reading off the USB stick slowly, very slowly. Go. Um, Kung Fu Panda, you've all seen the first two Kung Fu Panda movies, I think, about all the plush toys. Your kids are enamored by it. The next film up coming out of our studio uh, is interestingly going to release in China first. Kung Fu Panda 3 is being targeted and worked as a co-production with our studio in China. It's one of the very first feature-length animations done with the US with China as a co-producer. It puts us in an interesting position 
um, for the revenue streams as well as for the responsibility to be true to Chinese business practices and the culture. The movie is being targeted to come out at Christmas in China, but not until January for us because Star Wars comes out in Christmas in the US and you could be second or you could move your release date. That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> we, we pick second. <clears throat> A couple more examples of Poe. One of the interesting things about the process, a little bit like software development, someone has an idea, a script or a story element or an elevator pitch. Then you start doing rough drafts, you start doing um, top level designs. In the OpenStack community, you might propose a blueprint. You decide that you want to tell a story and then you start designing that story. And this is an example of some concept art. On the left is a hand-drawn animation of what Poe might look like in one of the sequences, showing body position, facial position. Believe it or not, this sort of reference material becomes input into the technology group because we look for things in scenes like this that are gonna be hard to make. Go. Well, uh, so one of the challenges is that there's a slide in here, if it'll ever come up, that talks about how animation is pure creation and you can make anything your mind can imagine. But imagine if you had an infinite number of choices, it's almost impossible to make them. So one of the big challenges facing the filmmakers is to bound their ambition a little bit by not what's possible, but what tells a good story, what makes the story compelling, and uh, what kind of makes sense. This is kind of bizarre. There we go. Um, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, but there's, in the animation process, there's about anywhere from 12 to 15 different departments, dep depending on what sort of story you're telling and what sort of elements it needs to be told. One of the very early first departments is the story department. The story department's job is to figure out for 90 minutes what the story's gonna look like, how the characters interact, how they emote, what's their motivation, all that typical Hollywood storytelling stuff. But it's important, because if you don't have a good coherent story, Partway through you get bored, partway through you might decide that those characters aren't doing things that, that make sense and you're disinterested and, you, and we lose you as an audience member. So uh, the process itself is highly iterative. It takes five years to make a movie and the first two or three years of it are iterating over trying to tell the story. The mechanism used to tell that story are called storyboards. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> That wasn't in my pitch. That's all right. Is it telling me I'm not going fast enough? Right. Beautiful. Thank you. Hey, this clip worked, but I don't have audio. So this is an example of a story reel. This is the manifestation of telling the story as a series of paper panels. The old way we used to draw on paper, put them up on these big four by eight bulletin boards, and then people would pitch the story. They'd go up and, and pantomime the characters and act it out and show all the creatives and the people making the film what they were thinking about the character movement, how the camera was blocked, um, how the action might sync up with the audio. And we'll iterate like this for a couple of years. It's interesting, in the old days, they were drawn on paper and then scanned in and presented as a digital reel like this one. Currently, they're drawn on the computer using Cintiq tablets and then printed out and stuck on bulletin boards. So we just, it's the same process, we just turned it around. And the thing that's amazing about it is walls full of storyboards are still a very easy medium to edit. A couple thumbtacks, move the paper around, draw a line through it, cross it out. It's the fastest way to iterate on a whole lot of visual information. I always imagine someday we'll have walls covered in e-ink and we can just run around and scribble, but uh, we're not there yet. So after it iterates in story for a while, it goes into a department called animation. Even though the process is called animation, only about 10% of the people working on the product animate. So animation is the part where you take the character that's been modeled by a modeler and rigged by a rigger. Uh, rigging is to add control points to the hands, joints, fingers, arms, and all that sort of stuff, and pose that character and make them do their performance. The animators are the true actors. They get the character to emote and tell the part of the story. So this is the same clip with the same audio. Imagine the little running around and Jack Black shouts some things as he jumps out. 
without the background, flat lit, without a lot of what are called effects, just to get the character animation figured out. So the characters themselves are moving with full fidelity using the fully rigged model at, at um, sort of the best resolution and the best performance that you can get. Interestingly, note right here you can see Crane in full glory. It's the whole character. He was animated in complete detail. Then we get to the next step, which is called lighting. Lighting is the very last step of the show. It's when we go through and position lights in space, calculate the collision of light rays and all the geometry in 3D and where the lights are. Crane turned into a shadow. Imagine if you were the animator who had worked on this guy for two years and all the, in this particular scene he's just a shadow because the lighter decided later on, for cinematography reasons, it would look better if it was just a shadow. So this is the final lit version of this piece of the sequence. And you can see it has shading, it has shadow, it has light, it has reflections, has uh, ambient um, occlusion, it has all that stuff. The logo is in full 3D and it looks glorious. This is the almost last step of the process. And our Kung Fu Panda friends. So then, like I said, a little bit about the production process. Five years to make a movie. Uh, Animation 101, a 90-minute movie is chopped up into 35 to 50 sequences. A sequence is a location, and the sequence in turn is chopped up into 20 to 50 scenes. So if we were doing a movie about people in a conference who've been here for four days and are waiting for lunch, this would be our location. We'll call this sequence 100. I'd aim the camera over there, shot one. Camera over there, that shot two. So the movie itself is chopped up into work like that and issued to different departments and worked on in parallel. So the movie is made out of order. Uh, and you, you only view it linearly pretty much at the end. 130,000 frames to make a movie. A film goes through a projector at 24 frames per second. That's left over from the days when Edison couldn't make the projector mechanics go any faster without jamming. We're digital now. There's no film projector and physical media here. We still do 24 frames a second. It's just legacy. Frame is thousands of assets. An asset, and that's an important bit for when we get to the Swift part, an asset is a file or a description of a file or a collection of descriptions of files that describe the relationship of all the things that go into making a frame. <clears throat> and then each character, Poe, Crane, they have control points. They're a, a three-dimensional model that has a kinematic system, it has bones, it has hair, skin, muscles. Cloth and hair and things like that are added after through a different department. And each of those, in order to pose the character to get their animation, have control points, finger, hair, joint, facial animation. Uh, in How to Train Your Dragon, as an example, uh, the Dragon Toothless had 4,500 different control points. So an animator's job is essentially to edit a graph of how things move through space. So the end result of this, and I mentioned this earlier, we produce data that happens to look good played at 24 hertz through a projector, but primarily we manufacture data. The data represents intellectual property, represents characters, hopefully tells a compelling story and convinces you to go to Walmart and buy plush toys. It's kind of the goal. Um, we're also a file-based HPC shop. One film will consume, consume 75 million CPU hours over its lifetime, most of that in the last three or four months. That's about 8,500 CPU years. So if you start now, you can get one movie done perhaps. We, we each show, we have about a 20,000 core compute farm dedicated to visualization, computation, rendering. Uh, a show at peak will use about half of that. Uh, since these shows are four or five years long, we release two shows a year. We've got six or seven in flight at any given time. We concentrate mostly from a resource perspective on the next three. The one that's going to get released next is the most important, but the two after that are doing screenings and trailers and other sort of production work that's just as critical. Uh, each show completes with a 300 to 500 terabyte footprint of storage. That's really important stuff that artists create. We call those assets. That's intermediate stuff we make that we, um, the cutting room floors, you will, are things that are used as, uh, in, to inform the later processes. And then there's the ad deli as delivered movie. The 2.2 billion asset transactions, that's some process or some user or some compute machine asking the asset management system for an asset. I need pose right harm. I need this eyeball, I need this piece of a tree, I need this piece of a rock. Uh, that's done as a software as a service middleware deployment that we built ourselves. Uh, that's important for how we adopted Swift because we needed that layer between applications that don't understand object stores and the object store itself. And the end product, what we manufacture at the end of the day is 250 billion pixels that are all neatly organized in the right way so that the movie is compelling to watch. So what's Swift got to do with it? Why, where, where does Swift come in and why do we care about Swift, 
both as an object store and Swift as a delivery mechanism. If you think about file services, there's really three parts. There's persistence, durability, data protection, making sure that you don't lose anything. There's a permission and security and protection. And then there's delivery. You have to get the bits from where they are to where you need them. Uh, write once or write only file systems aren't very useful. This is the entire department layout for an animation feature. We talked a little bit about story. They iterate at the top until we have something we want to tell. It's the rough draft. Manufacturing the movie is very expensive and very time consuming, so we try not to start until the movie is fairly well understood. Each of those lines represents what's called an asset handoff. I might do some work product, say, in the editorial department, which describes how long each scene and sequence are in, what order they're in, and what the audio looks like. And I hand that off to each of the other departments. Each of those asset handoffs is millions of files, potentially. Uh, they're hand and each department gets handoffs from its upstream and hands things to its downstream departments multiple times a day. First place that we're using Swift is in our production management and uh, production asset management environment, which we're taking advantage of the um, high performance, scalable, durability features of Swift. We use this as the, the back end both for um, content that artists create for some of the middle components as well as a delivered product. Our asset middleware called PAM in turn leverages Swift's middleware to do some things it needed to do that weren't in native Swift. This wasn't a full OpenStack deploy. This was a deploy of object storage. So we, we selected Swift Stack as the vendor to help manage and uh, install that infrastructure. One of the things that we needed was something Swift didn't have, which is have, sorry, which is object immutability, the ability to guarantee that an object couldn't get changed by somebody else when you put it into a certain state. The notion of immutability in an eventually consistent, globally accessible object store was kind of a mismatch. So we worked with SwiftStack Engineering, and they, we came up with a way to do a delegated authorization. So when you do a Swift object put with a certain header in the file, it calls out to our authentication server, and we give a thumbs up or a thumbs down as whether or not you have access, if you can overwrite it, if you can delete it, or if we should go call the police. So it gives us a way to intercept in the Swift proxy and do authentication. You can use it too. It's in the product. Pretty cool. Um, the key to using an asset management system based on Swift in production is that our data set is, is almost entirely read-only once it's been published. We need to do highly scalable reads into the compute farm in order to do the computations to get the next piece of the data. We currently are deliver most of that data set using NFS. We do about a million and a half NFS ops a second into the compute farm at scale. The objects that are being delivered out of Swift are more complex, so we don't have to do a million and a half ops, but we're looking at anywhere from 300 to 500,000 object gets per second. Most of those will come out of the cache. Couldn't do that out of the true object store. I can do maybe 600 or 800, but if I get the object once out of Swift, I put it into a scalable caching tier, and then I deliver from there at a pretty high rate. It, it works out well. The other thing we like about Swift geographic diversity and global reach. I mentioned we have studios in Southern California, we have studio in Bangalore and our studio in China. Animation is a very collaborative sport. You need people working on the same data set at the same time, delivering content into the same repository for reuse by everybody else. As a nice handy side effect of working collaboratively, I get geographic dur durability. I get my replications, not just in different parts of the data center, I get them in different parts of the world. So if all of California explodes, could happen. Uh, the India operation could continue production on the film because the assets are all in country. Uh, and our, our PAM middleware piece knows geographic location of the data set. If I ask for an asset and I don't have it in that data center, it'll go get it from wherever it lives and bring it back. By using Swift underneath the hood, Swift can do the object motion, and our middleware piece can just expect that the data is available in those geos. And if it hasn't replicated yet, Swift will go get it for you. That's one of the nice features. Archiving. So this is, if you recognize, this is the scene at the end of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Archiving and asset preservation are near and dear to our hearts because our product is data, and in order to monetize and use um, that data for other revenue streams down the road, I have to have it. I have to have it with high integrity, and I have to keep it for a low price. The, I'll go to the next slide. So archiving is an event. I have a data set, I like it, I archive it. I put it in a cardboard box, I put it in the warehouse next to the Ark of the Covenant, and I forget all about it. That doesn't really work because your data needs, it needs to be preserved. It's more like art. You have to steward it. You have to keep it clean. You have to check it out every once in a while. So 
I like to say asset preservation is a lifestyle. If you're not consciously stewarding your data, doing media refresh, doing technology refreshes, in 50 plus years that data won't have any value to you because you won't be able to find it or get it. And 50 years isn't really very long. That's the, the time horizon that we look at because that's the durability of physical film. Other companies, you talk to the people from Ancestry or the LDS Church or the genomics guys, they're basically keeping their data sets forever. Where the data is persistent, the technology changes, the um, mechanisms for moving data around will change. I mean, they're talking about storing data in DNA, which is funny because in genetics, I can store data about DNA in DNA, which is confusing. The, um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that you need to be very strategic intentional about stewarding your data and keeping it around. And if you can't do it for a price point lower than the value of the data, then you're storing liabilities. And nobody wants to keep liabilities around. Either delete it or keep it forever safely, high integrity with low price. One of the other use cases that I use sometimes is kind of an odd one. It's to treat an object store as a big giant LUN with named variable length blocks. If you think about it, if I named my blocks one, two, three, four through some number and they were all 512 bytes long, I could treat my object store exactly like a, a, a block device. The model works there in two different places. We're using the SwiftStack NAS gateway as a way to get NFS and Samba protocols translated into an object store to support legacy applications. And we're using a Veer scalable NAS caches backed by object stores as a way to get low cost durability storage for high performance NAS delivery of assets. That data set is primarily our transient data set. There's a large amount of stuff we compute only to reuse for anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks that's recreatable upstream but at a cost. Oh, and the t typical things you'd expect with OpenStack. So we have Swift underneath our OpenStack deployments to do glance and image and container repository, to do build artifacts and deployment, to do logs, to do all the stuff you'd expect it to do in an OpenStack environment, and for the applications that are enlightened enough to talk to storage, uh, sorry, object store directly. Okay, so Peabody's the smartest dog I know, and he's gonna help me answer questions. Questions, gotta be questions. Um, given that Manila is coming out with, uh, with, with the technology to share uh, uh, through, uh, through files, would you do this differently now or are you still using Swift and if so, how do you compare these two? Which vendor, on? which vendor had you mentioned? To, to no, uh, in Kilo release they have uh, Manila, which is the uh, file share mechanism. So oh, my basic question is, I mean, is there a reason why you opted for Swift? Uh, as opposed to a uh, file share, an object store as opposed to a file share? Uh, well, most file shares don't work well globally. The ones that do work globally that can give you the same namespace and access to the same bytes with the same path have an object store underneath them. I haven't met any globally distributed NFS servers, for example, that actually work. Because I've got people at both sides doing millions of ops on the same data set, and I needed to transit the globe. NFS in particular is chatty. Samba is even worse, and you can't do either. You can't do locking at any kind of scale more than about 10 or 15 milliseconds. So the object store lets me make my NAS eventually consistent. If not Swift, it would be some other object store. But at last summer was the summer of object store. I looked at all of them. Uh, Swift has the best global characteristics, so it enabled the sort of file sharing at a distance that we were looking for. So you're actually writing to this store also, right? It's not just read. No, we're writing to both. So what's, what's interesting is I mentioned that middleware piece provides one of its functions in addition to asset management is address translation. So if an application says, I need this piece of data, it looks it up in a database and says, that's available on NFS, that's available in Swift, that's available in Swift but in California, and we'll transit the data around and provide it to you. When an artist at their workstation does a model or creates a piece of imagery, that's committed as an asset. Uh, our versioning system is only whole new objects. It's all right and everything's versioned. We don't delete anything or modify anything in place. So I can have multiple different versions of things in flight. It, it tends to be read mostly because, for example, the lighting artists read the models but they don't change them. They read the texture maps but they don't change them. The render farm reads everything and only produces imagery at the end. So almost everything's read mostly. Thank you. Can you share a little more detail on the archive uh, in terms of like what actual technologies you're using there? Is it LTO tape? Is it you know like when you need to actually move things? Yeah. Uh, so, so it's in it's in transition. What we're doing today is 
a collection of some hand whittled scripts. If you talk to an a digital archivist, they encourage multiple copies multiple ways, multiple technologies. Uh, we use, and many people in the media industry use, a product called Front Porch Digital, which is a content store that's tape backed. Uh, the intent, and I'm, we're building some middleware to do this ourselves, and I'm shopping for media asset management systems that can do this. The intent is I ingest a piece of media that I want to preserve, and it makes a copy in Swift, and it makes a copy through Front Porch onto tape. Tape goes off site, and I never look at it unless my Swift copy explodes. It's the golden copy, it's the one that has the most value. By abstracting tape away with a piece of, I guess if you have too many middle, sideware, it'll do media management, media refresh, and technology refresh of the tape media, where the middleware piece just tracks the fact that it's, an, it's another object-related system. But I've got them in two technologies with two different delivery mechanisms and two different latency characteristics. All my reads for old material will come out of Swift, and all my writes will go to both places. Someday, one or more of those legs might be a service, but if you've ever done the cost math on storing object store in the cloud, the cost as a service over time, if you ever read the data, is ridiculous. You can do it cheaper on-premise always today. And are you tracking, you said with the preservation, um, you know, it needs some attention over time. Certainly if at a 50-year horizon, you're challenged with you know, the format of the files or the format of the objects and stuff. Absolutely, so do you have a yeah. system to track that? No, like, it, it's a huge We can get the challenge. file back, but we don't have the app to read it in. You yeah, know? so one of the things we do is, is we, we publish the source code and the, and the description of the file formats along with it, sort of like a Rosetta Stone. The intent is that some clever software engineer in the future will be able to read the Python script and the d description of the thing and either run an emulator that knows how to run the emulator that knows how to read the stuff back, or they'll just read the stuff back using current technologies. You, th you think about it, certain file formats have been around forever. There will always be a reader for TIFF files. They're just, they're, it's open source, you can compile it yourself. For our proprietary file formats, we've talked about maybe we normalize them into something else. But publishing the source code in a Rosetta Stone, we've talked about publishing the VMs that run the application stack that can read the files. Uh, it, it gets kind of crazy. And it's even worse when you think past 50 years to like 500 years. Hopefully we leave enough evidence the archaeologists can figure it out. Or the guy after me. As long as it's still there when I retire, then we're in good shape. So, so caching is one of the key pieces to making all of this work. Yes. Is your caching implementation ubiquitous with anything being able to cache, cache anywhere, or is it lumpy where certain caches get certain pieces of data and other caches don't? Uh, we've done both in the past. Currently, the caches are unified. Um, what happens is the little bit of stuff that's infrequently used, you pay a, a first read penalty, and then after that, it tends to stay in the cache. Metadata, for example, we pin. Uh, data sets, we tend to let float because we have pretty good locality over time. Uh, we're experimenting. Today, we're using um, Apache Traffic Server and Nginx caches. They're very web-centric, and they do a lot of extra stuff. So we're experimenting with writing our own um, Swift-specific storage delivery cache layer. One of the things Swift can't do is it can inject cache control headers into the mix, as an example. So by writing our own, we can have an API where we can inject cache control headers when the objects persisted, maybe as metadata on the objects. So when it gets read, you get time to live characteristics or other sort of invalidation so stuff. So once it's cached, all of your 30,000 cores have equally quick access to it? No, actually. So we, um, it's, the Brenner Farm's distributed. So the model is the caches are adjacent to the compute, and they, they provide both um, WAN acceleration for the data set, they provide offload from the origin Swift service, and they provide scale out within the local data center. So we have a compute-only data center in Las Vegas, which is about nine milliseconds away from Southern California. First read goes over the WAN, but every read after that is satisfied by the local cache. So then have you um, integrated your batch scheduling tool? I think you use MRG now, is that we right? We use MRG, yeah, Condor. Have, have you uh, integrated it with that so that when batch jobs hit the system, they try to go somewhere where it's already cached, or do they just go somewhere we, random? We haven't yet, but uh, data affinity scheduling is really important. The amount of inertia that data has versus the inertia that compute has is really, really a big difference. Yeah. Moving you know, 500 terabytes of data to do some math on it is dumb. Move the compute to where the data is. So we're working really hard to do data affinity-based scheduling to move the compute where the data most likely was okay. or is. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? So I wondered, uh, had you uh, looked at Ceph, and do you have any uh, editorial about the difference between Swift and Ceph in uh, that? We, we have looked at Ceph. A couple, I looked a couple years ago where it was a little bit premature. 
and um, not necessarily Ceph's fault, but the underlying file systems had challenges. Ceph is less an object store than a block store that has object capabilities. Um, since Red Hat bought them, I expect some commercialized versions of Ceph as object store, but it wasn't when I looked, and when I looked last summer, doing all the sorts of things we wanted it to do. It's still a little manual to operate. Um, doesn't have some of the same characteristics. Another year or so, the decision might be different. And one of the things we like about our strategy is having abstracted middleware, I can put a different back end on there without changing the applications at all. And so I get sort of the best of everything. Thank you. Uh, assuming that you had uh, data stored elsewhere before you went to Swift, have you moved everything over or uh, is this all net new? Uh, did you migrate data from existing archives or other stores? No, we are migrating yeah, today. So the existing archives are on IBM tape managed by TSM, which is a backup system. Backup systems are terrible archive systems, but sometimes you use what you have. So there's an ongoing initiative to read that material back in, do a little curating to see if it's still stuff we want that makes sense and reorganizing, and then re-ingesting it into the archive. That's labor intensive. You don't want to have to do that very often. You want your media refresh really to be an automated, low cost, low labor thing. But since we have to do labor on this one, we're going to take a chance to cull the data set a little bit. Anybody else? All right, I'll be around for a little while if you have other things you want to talk about. Thank you. <clears throat>